Wow, you got quiet pretty quickly, which is really good because it tells me you're anxious to hear tonight's message, and I am anxious as well uh, to hear it. Uh, my name is Tom Morgan. I'm the director of the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice here at College of St. Scholastica. Uh, tonight's lecture is sponsored by the Allworth Center, as, uh, of which I'm the director, and funded in part by the Warner uh, Lecture Series of the Manitou Fund, the, De the DeWitt and Carolyn Van Ever Foundation, and by Mary C. Van Ever in memory of William Van Ever, a former trustee of the college. Additional support has been received from Reader Weekly of Duluth and from numerous other private donors. Thanks again. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all you people who support these lectures and keep coming back. Um, little previews of coming attractions. On Saturday, I have to, I have to promote this. I feel it's an Allworth sponsored event, Allworth Center sponsored event, also sponsored by Minnesota Public Radio and uh, Duluth Sister Cities International. It's a concert in this auditorium at 7.30 uh, on Saturday evening uh, that I think it's fair to say will be unique, second annual, featuring a variety of musical styles, including percussion, a grand opera, hip hop, classical violin, a bell choir, and traditional folk music. And the idea is to display all these very fine artists uh, singly, hear their own idioms, and then uh, bring them together. And you get the metaphor for sister cities, I hope. So anyway, uh, there are uh, posters about the, the concert in the lobby and uh, tickets are available in the box office, which will be open after, during, after this lecture, so you can do that. Back to tonight's program. You all should have uh, received something like this in your hands when you came in. After every lecture, as you regulars know, we have a talkback session in which uh, we gather, oftentimes on neutral ground, so to speak, and talk about what we heard from this podium. And, uh, and analyze it a little bit. And the two people that are gonna help do that are Angie Miller, and her biography is there and very well qualified to do this, I think. And Bob Hoffman, one of my colleagues here at St. Scholastica, uh, an economist with a special interest in poverty issues. Uh, and I believe uh, you will agree that when you hear our speaker's message that it has profound economic implications. His, uh, so I think we we can profit from hearing from both Angie and Bob Hoffman. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet out in the lobby if you're not on our mailing list or email list, especially if you give me your email. Print very carefully. It's really hard to get those emails right if I don't, um, you know, if, if I can't read your writing. But I'm happy to keep you all uh, up to date on what we're doing. Uh, this is the first of five lectures this season, as you know. Um, on, the, um, on the screen to your left, we're displaying the text of tonight's lecture through technology called real-time captioning. And all, although we anticipate a high quality format, there will inevitably be errors that are inherent to the technology. Nevertheless, research indicates that many viewers benefit from captioning including those with hearing, without hearing loss and with hearing loss. A special thank you to the Edwin H. Eddy Foundation, whose generous support makes this inclusive service possible tonight. So, as I said, this is the first in a series of talks uh, this academic year under the general heading of Listening to Voices of America. Our speaker this evening is a freelance journalist whose work has appeared in The Nation, The Atlantic, New York Magazine, The American Prospect, The New Yorker Online, Village Voice, The Daily Beast, and a host of other uh, publications. Originally from England and a graduate of Oxford University, he has since adopted his mother's homeland of America and now lives in San Francisco with his wife Julie and their children Sophia, 13, and Leo, 9. Uh, Julie, by the way, is a professor of American Studies at UC Davis, which is why they're in San Francisco. 
Uh, Mr. Abramsky has a master's degree from Columbia University School of Journalism and currently is a senior fellow at the New York City-based Demos Think Tank. In addition, he teaches writing one day a week at, uh, UC Davis, at the UC Davis Writing Program. His latest book, a family memoir, is titled The House of 20,000 Books, and that came out last year. Other books that he's published in the past decade and a half include Inside Obama's Brain, Breadline USA, and several books on the American criminal justice system, American Furies, Cond, and Hard Time Blues. However, tonight's talk will be based on The American Way of Poverty, his book which came out three years ago based on or inspired by Voices of Poverty. Voices of Poverty is a website Mr. Abramsky conceived five years ago to tell the stories of America's poor in their own voices. The site, by the way, is a continuing project. You'll find it on thevoicesofpoverty.org. When he's not writing articles or books, Mr. Abramsky enjoys playing tennis, listening to music, and traveling to far off places. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sasha Abramsky. Well, Tom, thank you for that extraordinarily generous introduction. Um, thank you to all of the faculty, to President Geary, to the Allworth family, and to everybody else who made this visit possible. And to all of you for coming out tonight to listen to and discuss poverty in America and what its implications are. It's a real honor to be at the College of St. Scholastica. It's an honor to be asked to come talk on this issue. And I hope that over the next hour or so, we can have a conversation about what I really do believe is one of the critical issues facing modern day America. You know, I started talking about my book in 2013, less than five years from the financial collapse and the housing market collapse and the employment market collapse. And five years on, the macroeconomic indicators were all still pretty bad. Unemployment was still pretty high in many parts of the country. The stock market still hadn't recovered to its pre-2008 levels. People's savings had been obliterated. People's sense of security had been obliterated. And there was no guarantee that we were going to pull ourselves out of the recession and its aftermath. And so I'd go around the country, I'd go to colleges, I'd go to think tanks, I'd go to libraries, and oftentimes in 2013 I'd start the conversation with a sort of litany of doom and gloom data. The doom and gloom data was all there and it was easy for people to understand because many people in the audience were personally a part of it. They'd lost jobs, they'd lost homes, they'd lost savings. They felt that their lives were going in the wrong direction. And then over the course of the last three years, a lot of the big picture economic data improved significantly. Unemployment went down, down to late 1990s levels. The stock market began roaring back to life. Economic growth compared to most of the rest of the developed world was very, very healthy in America. And in many parts of the country, housing values started rebounding. By many of the big picture measures, the economy was on the right track. And so I started varying up my speeches a little bit. And instead of opening with doom and gloom, I'd open with a bunch of good news. But nobody asked me to come talk at colleges to give good news. Because apparently I'm one of these guys you ask because you want to be depressed when you hear me talk. <laughs> so I'd give the good news and then I'd say, hey, but wait a second, let's complicate the story a little bit. And then I'd give the bad news. And I'd start talking about the things that were still wrong with the economy. And the reasons that people still felt frustrated economically. The good reasons that people felt frustrated. It wasn't irrationality. There were many, many good reasons for people all over this country in urban areas, in rural areas, in suburbs, in the north, in the south, and so on, 
there were good reasons to feel frustrated with the way the economy was shaping up. So that was the second permutation. And now let's turn the wheel again and go to the third permutation. Because today, late September 2016, we're six weeks out from a presidential election in which one of the two candidates for the most powerful office on earth is running on a campaign of sheer demagogy and race baiting and religion baiting and pitting one group against another group against another group and saying to one group, your problems will be solved, not if we all improve, but your problems will be solved if we take something away from these people over here. Your jobs will be improved if we build a wall to keep those people out. Your circumstances will be improved if we ban an entire religion from entering the country. Never in recent American political history have we seen a campaign run on hatred to this extent. And the idea that a man who advocates torture, who advocates collective killing of opponents, who believes that dissent is equatable with treason, and who believes that protesters who disagree with him should have their faces smashed in. The idea that this man could soon be the face of America before the rest of the world fills me with existential horror. And on a lighter note, it also impacted my wardrobe. I was all set to dress very fancily for this event tonight. I got my suit out, and then I looked at the suit, and the label on it said Donald Trump. <laughs> and I couldn't bring myself to wear that suit. I think I'm going to have a bonfire when I go home. <laughs> so you're stuck with my jeans, I'm afraid. But on a serious note, here's my question. How does a man like Donald Trump emerge in a country as prosperous as America? Because usually demagogues thrive in countries in some kind of collapse, be it economic or military constitutional or demographic. But America's economy is intact. It's got 4.9% unemployment. It's got a growing GMP. It's got a rising stock market. Its military, far from being defeated, is the strongest on earth. Its political institutions may be dysfunctional and they may be frustrating, but we still have a democratic electoral system. And its population, far from being in demographic crisis, far from being decimated by disease or famine, its population is booming. So again, the question emerges, how does a demagogue arise in a country as prosperous as America? And the answer, I think, and I've been thinking about it a lot recently, at least in part lies in the way that the economy has changed. Not just since 2008, though that provided the headlines, but over the past half century. For during those years and during those decades, a growing number of people at the bottom of the economy found that their earning power was declining, found that in real terms, the amount they could sell their labor for was going down. They found that their life opportunities were shrinking. They found that the prospects for their children instead of getting brighter, we're getting more bleak. And amidst all of the broad prosperity, all of the prosperity that created more billionaires than any other country on earth, amidst all of that prosperity, for these tens of millions of men, of women, and of children, times have become unremittingly tough. And the deck has appeared not just marginally stacked against them, but profoundly and permanently stacked against them. Now, earlier this month, the Census Bureau released its latest data on poverty and on household incomes. And there was a lot of good news in that data. The good news was, for the first time since 2007, median household income in the country jumped, not just a little bit, but fairly significantly, went up from 53,000 and change in 2014 to 56,000 and change in 2015. About a 5% increase. 
course, the bad news was it took a decade for ordinary Americans to see that pay increase. And during that decade, medium income had gone down by 16%. So the good news was it bounced back a little bit, but it was bouncing back from a very, very low base. Second bit of good news in the poverty data. In 2015, 13.5% of families in America, of people in America, were living in poverty. And that contrasted very, very well with 2014 when it was 14.7%. So in the space of one year, more than 1% of Americans who had been living in poverty found their way up beyond the government's poverty line. Of course, on the bad news, that still means that by the government's own very, very cautious measures of poverty, more than 43 million Americans live below the poverty line. And to give you an indication of how cautious that measure is, for a single individual in this country to be considered below the poverty line, they have to have about $11,000 or less in income. For a family of four, it's about $22,000. Now, in reality, if you're a family of four and you have 25 or 26 or 27,000, even if the government doesn't consider to be, you to be living in poverty, you're struggling. You're struggling to pay your rent. You're struggling to pay your car bills. God forbid you get sick because then you're going to be struggling mightily with medical bills. You're struggling to put food on the table for your children. And you're struggling to provide basic supplies when they go to school. On every level, you're struggling with the basic necessities of life. And by the government own measure, 43 million, or if you include foster kids and various other groups, 45.7 million Americans, even in these improved times, are living in poverty. That is an extraordinary number of people. And each one of those individuals has a story to tell. They're not just numbers, and they're not just stereotypes. And they're not just cardboard cutouts. They are real men, real women, real children, with all of the pain and the heartbreak of being excluded from an economy of prosperity. So how has this happened? It hasn't happened because the economy as a whole has seized up. Quite the contrary. In fact, as I was mentioning a few minutes ago, nationally, unemployment is down to below 5%. It's at the level it was in the so-called economic miracle of the late 1990s. The number of jobs being created on a monthly basis is upwards of a quarter of a million. And in states like California, where I live, which for a decade or more were hammered not just by unemployment, not just by all of the collateral damage of the housing market collapse, but by government revenue collapse, which led to cuts in basic services like classrooms, libraries, investments in roads, investment in public safety. In California and many, many other states, the budget situation has improved as the broader economy has improved, and there finally are monies available for vital investments. That's all good. In Oregon, north of where I live, unemployment peaked about 10%, now back down to 6%. In Michigan, not too far from here, Unemployment peaked again in double digits as the car industry imploded. Now the car industry is roaring back to life. Unemployment in Michigan is just over 5%. Nebraska is down to 2.7%. And here in Minnesota, unemployment's at 4%. A little bit higher than it was last year when it went all the way down to 3.6% here. But still, by historical standards, unemployment is very, very low in this state. And all of this is good. But let's complicate the story a bit. If unemployment is low, if jobs are being created, if people are getting paychecks, how come we still have 43 million people in poverty? How come one in six Americans, one in six Americans, is classified by the government as being food insecure, meaning they worry about where the next meal is going to come from? How come in city after city, one in four kids lives below the poverty line? How come in city after city, in the South in particular, one in three African-American children live below the poverty line? It's not because everyone's unemployed. 
is because the jobs that are being created, many of them pay minimum wage. And they pay less than the jobs that were lost during the recession. People are working, but they're staying in place or getting swept backwards economically. Or people are not working, but they're not considered unemployed. Because from 2008 to 2015, so many people lost their jobs and so many people failed to find new work <clears throat> that 3% of the labor force stopped looking for work. If you stop looking for work, you become statistically invisible. You're no longer unemployed, you're jobless. You don't become part of that headline unemployment figure. So when we talk about a 5% unemployment figure, in reality, what that means is 5% of the workforce is unemployed and looking for work. Another 3%, give or take, of the workforce dropped out of the labor market post-2008 and isn't looking for work. And to make that picture even more complicated, there are 2 million adults living behind bars in this country in jails or prison. We have one quarter of the world's prison population. Well, if you live in jail or you live in prison, you're not considered to be unemployed. That's about 2% of the adult workforce. One and a half, two percent So if you add in the jobless, the unemployed, and the prison population, we actually have a population without employment that's much closer to 10% than 5%. And that is a huge number of people, and it represents a huge amount of suffering and of indignity and of emotional trauma and all the other things that go with long-term joblessness. So, yes, the economy is growing, and that's a good thing. Yes, we're doing better than many of the countries we like to compare ourselves to economically when you look at the headline data on unemployment or on GDP growth or on wealth accumulation. But when you break it down, you find the fruits of that growth are so unevenly divided in 21st century America when you break it down, you find that overwhelmingly more than 90% of the profit and benefit of all of the increased productivity of the last few years, 90% of it has gone to the top 1% of the economy. A few years back in 2011, the Occupy movement popularized this phrase, the 1% versus the 99%. And it was a little bit crude and it didn't tell the full story, but it was a useful summary of what was happening. That in the modern American economy, we're developing an oligarchy. And that oligarchy right at the top, and actually the 1% isn't really where the economic power lies, it's at the 0.1% level. Or even more so at the 0.01% level. A few thousand families control trillions and trillions of dollars of assets. A few thousand families control the equivalent assets of the bottom 50 million Americans. And that is the real story. That over the last 40 years, the economy has been restructured so that the further up the economic pyramid you get, the more benefits accrue your way. You pay lower taxes. You have access to globalized markets. You have this cornucopia of produce that you can buy cheaply and of labor who can serve you cheaply. And the lower down that pyramid you go, the more you find people in depressed communities and depressed neighborhoods scrabbling just to stay in place. And oftentimes failing in their quest to provide basic provisions for their families. I'll say again what I said a few minutes ago. The median wage post-2008 went down 16%. In actual fact, you have to go back to the early 1970s to find the high watermark for the bottom 20% earning power in the United States. You have to go back 40 years to when I was running around in diapers during Richard Nixon's presidency. That is when income potential for the bottom 20% of Americans peaked. You see it all over the country. 
You see areas in the Central Valley in California with 25 to 30 percent poverty. Even in a prosperous, low unemployment state like Minnesota, if you go up, and I might mispronounce these counties' names, I apologize, Wadena, 16.9 percent of residents live in poverty. Blue Earth, 19 percent live in poverty. Beltrami, 22 percent live in poverty. Manonan, 26.9 percent, more than one in four residents in that county, in this prosperous state, lives below the poverty line. What does that mean on the ground? It means if you're, I'll give you different demographics, if you're white and your highest education is a high school graduation and you have no college education, if you're a man, it means your life expectancy in the last 20 years has gone down by three years. If you're a woman, a white woman without a high school, without a university education, it means your average life expectancy has gone down by five years. It means that your communities are peculiarly vulnerable to opiate addictions. It means your communities, especially if you are black or brown, are peculiarly vulnerable to arrest, to prosecution, to incarceration for prolonged periods of time, not necessarily for serious offenses, but for the offenses that accompany poverty. It means that you are sending your children to schools that are underinvested in, to classrooms with 35 and 40 kids, to textbooks that are 10 or 20 years old, to science labs that haven't been repaired in decades. It means increasingly that if you have a mental illness, you do not get the treatment you need and you are fairly likely to end up homeless or in jail. It means that if you are trying to access affordable housing, good luck to you because as a society, since the early 1980s, we have made policy choices one upon another upon another to not invest in public housing and to underinvest in affordable housing. Which means if you're poor, you have a better than even chance of living in an overcrowded, unsanitary apartment building where your kids are exposed to mold and therefore more likely to develop asthma and other respiratory diseases, where there are cockroach and rodent infestations, and where basic safety requirements like keeping lights on in public areas and apartment complexes are no longer adhered to by slum lords who do not fear that they'll be prosecuted. And I do not speak in the abstract here. As a journalist, I go around the country and I talk to people and I go into their houses and I chronicle their living conditions. I did a story a few months back in Southern California, in Santa Ana, and I went into houses which were three bedroom houses that had been subdivided with cardboard blocks and with sheets to accommodate 20 and in some cases 30 people. Strangers living in cots, in hallways, in kitchens, in any public area they could, and being charged hundreds of dollars a month for the privilege by slum landlords. In the 21st century, the new normal, in these poor communities in Minnesota, in these poor communities in California, in places like Camden in New Jersey or Gary in Indiana, the new normal is a profoundly insecure an increasingly unequal place. It's a place where if you are on the right side of the tracks, if you are in that 1% where things are going your way, they go your way big time. And if you're on the wrong side of the tracks, your lives increasingly resemble those of the residents of slums in the late 19th century chronicled by one of my journalistic heroes, Jacob Rees, in the 1890s onwards. That you will live in overcrowded, unsanitary conditions, that your working conditions will increasingly be abysmal, that you will be underpaid for your labor, that you will have only fragile access to health care, 
that a dream of a pension is just that, a dream, and that things like basic paid maternity leave, things that in other first world countries are taken for granted, are absolutely out of bounds for the working class in many communities in America. I went to North Las Vegas. How many people in this audience have been to Las Vegas? Awful lot of people. You go to Las Vegas to see a show, maybe to gamble a little bit, go and get some good food, maybe go to a nice bar afterwards. But there's a flip side to Las Vegas, and it's about three miles from the Strip. It's a very gritty neighborhood called North Las Vegas, very poor, a lot of troubles, a lot of drug addiction, a lot of halfway houses. And I went to the largest high school in, in Las Vegas, high school with about 2,500 students. I went there in 2011. And the principal there said, I need to introduce you to my homeless counselor, Angela Urquiaga. And I was a little bit confused, because I've done a lot of reporting in schools, and I've met a lot of counselors, i met a lot of teachers. I've never met a full-time homeless counselor in a school before. And I asked her, you know, why, do you, why does your school need you? Why do they need a full-time homeless counselor? And she said to me, well, look, when the housing crisis started in 2007, 2008, we had about 50 homeless students. And then the next year, we had about 100. Next year, we had about 150. And by 2011, there were over 200 homeless students in this one school. 8% of the students were homeless. And she said to me, look, some of these kids are couch surfing with their families. Some of them are living with relatives. Some of them are living in church basements. Some of them are living in cars. And some of them are literally living on the streets. And then she said to me, look, how do these kids have a fair chance in life? Because we're asking them to do all these things. We're asking them to study. We're asking them to try and prepare for higher education. We're trying to give them a sense of civics and everything else. And these kids don't have a home they can call their own. They don't have a place they can go to for a hot meal after school. They don't have somewhere they can sit in a quiet environment and do their homework. The decks are stacked against these kids right from the get-go. I went to Stockton in the Central Valley in California. I talked to a man called Matthew Joseph. And he was middle-aged, he was about 50, he was a steel worker, he was also a church deacon. And Matthew Joseph told me how at the height of the recession he had been called into his boss's office one day with several dozen of his colleagues and they'd all been told, sorry, we have to lay you off. And he was in one of these houses that one day was worth $400,000 and the next day was worth $200,000 and the day after that $150,000 as the housing market imploded. So here's this middle-aged guy with a family and he's out of work and he can't refinance his home because his home's now worth nothing. And he can't pay his mortgage because he has no income. And he said to me, I went home and I curled up in a fetal position on my bed and I started to cry because I didn't know how I was going to feed my family. I went to a little community in the southern New Mexico desert called Antony. And I met a family there, a couple, who had a little scrubby patch of land. And on that scrubby patch of land, they'd bought a mobile home. And they were living in the mobile home and making small payments on it. And then he lost his job. When he lost his job, they couldn't make payments on the mobile homes. The home is repossessed. And they had a cinder block storage unit on the site as well. So they moved into the cinder block storage unit. And it was this unventilated, damp, windowless unit, no electricity, no running water, no heating. And they had their possessions sort of piled up in one corner, and they were sleeping on a bed in the other, bundled up in their coats, and they were cooking on a propane stove. And in the center of the room was a wicker chair with a hole cut out, and under the hole was a commode. And at the end of the interview, I said to them, what is your American dream? And the woman looked at me, and she sort of laughed, and it wasn't a happy laugh. It was one of those laughs you do when you're very, very sad and very nervous. She looked at me, and she said very, very quietly, my dream is that one day I will have a home with a flush toilet. This is in 21st century United States of America. I went to a little town in Appalachian, Pennsylvania, and I met a woman called Luann Prokop, 
And she was middle-aged, a professional. She was educated to be an accountant. And for several decades had had a very good career as an accountant. And then again, the recession hit. And she was laid off. And if you're in your 50s and there's high unemployment, you're facing pretty daunting odds if you look for work. And she sends her resume out everywhere. And nobody replies. She sends it out all over her region of Pennsylvania. And then she starts sending it out all over Pennsylvania itself. And then she starts sending it out all over the country. And she can't get a job. And she runs through her savings. She cashes out her retirement plans. She takes her kids out of all their extracurriculars, their dance lessons, everything else. She stops making car payments. She runs late on her mortgage payments. And then she stops eating food three times a day because she can no longer afford the meals. She literally starts tightening her belt. And I interviewed her about three and a half, four years after she'd lost her job. And she'd finally found new work. And the new work was in a community center slash food pantry. And the downside was it paid one third the salary of her old job. The upside was she was now so poor that she qualified for pre free food from the food pantry at which she was working. Now all of these men, these women, these kids, they're bumping up against these tremendous economic transformations. There's a Yale political economist called Jacob Hacker, and he writes about something called the Great Risk Shift. And in the Great Risk Shift, which he says we've been undergoing over a 30 to 40 year period, in the Great Risk Shift, all of the risks of modern life are passed on to poorer, more vulnerable people. People having to pay out of pocket for medicines. People having to borrow spectacular amounts of money to go to college. People having to save if they can for their own retirements because defined benefit retirements have now gone out the window. That at every level, these people are facing a deck that has been rigged. Which is why, even though there's 5% unemployment or less, you see 50 million Americans worrying about how they're going to feed themselves and their kids. Which is why even after passage and implementation of the Affordable Care Act, somewhere between 10 and 15% of Americans still lack health insurance coverage. The only advanced industrial democracy on earth that doesn't guarantee health care to all of its residents. Which is why when you go to the deep south, where one state government after another rejected expansion of health care. You find startling numbers of adults with not even basic health care, not even emergency health care coverage. People dying of diabetes that could be treated, people dying of cancer that could be treated. People dying not because they're medically unsavable, but because they have been deemed expendable by the governments of the states and the cities in which they live in. Which is why, 5% unemployment or not, we still have millions of Americans caught in payday loan traps. The single most usurious form of lending in America. If you're middle class and you get a credit card, depending what your credit score is, you might pay 15, 20, 25, 30% a year interest. If you want to get a car and you have good finance, you go to a bank. Interest rates are extraordinarily low at the moment. You might pay 4% or less on a car loan. If you have good credit and you go and get a mortgage, same thing, you might be paying 3%. But if you're not middle class, and if you do not have good credit, and if you do not have stable, documentable sources of income, you go to a payday lender and you borrow for two weeks or four weeks at a time. And every time that two-week period ends, you pay a penalty if you do not repay the loan in full. It's not called interest, it's called fees. But whether you call it fees or whether you call it interest, if you are poor and you get stuck in a payday trap, you're not paying 10 or 20 or 30 percent a year interest, you're paying 400, 500, and in some cases, 600 percent a year interest. And it is legally sanctioned by federal and state regulations. If you are poor and you want to get a higher education, the only way to do it is to borrow vast amounts of money, whether from the government or from private sources, that depends on your situation. But increasingly, for young Americans trying to go up the economic pyramid, 
they start life handicapped by thousands, tens of thousands, in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt just for trying to get an education. In the past, one of the great rationales for all of this has been, yes, we don't have the kind of social programs that high tax economies like Denmark or Sweden or France or Germany or Canada have, but that's because we are dynamic. That the consequences of all of those high taxes and all of those social programs is that it stifles economic development. It stifles opportunity. Whereas in the United States of America, everybody with a little bit of oomph, a little bit of willingness to gamble, everybody can pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Well, that's physically impossible. You can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You fall over. But even if you could, and even if in the past some people did, when you look at social mobility data today, far from being the most socially mobile economy on earth, we are now less socially mobile than those high tax, high welfare economies like Scandinavian countries or Germany or Holland or Canada, France, even than England, which more or less follows the American business model. What does that mean in practice? What it means in practice is when you crunch the data, a person born into poverty in all of those other countries is much more likely to make their way out of poverty and to finish their life in the middle class than is a person born into poverty here. Here, if you're born into poverty, you're much more likely to spend your life trapped in that poverty. And you're much more likely to pass that poverty along to your children and they're more likely to pass it along to their children. So how has this happened? How have we ended up in this situation where we do not have these social provisions and we do not have the social mobility? We kind of ended up with the worst of all worlds in this one. But this goes back way before 2007-8. This goes back nearly half a century. And in some ways it's to do with a backlash that occurred about 40 years ago, a little more than 40 years ago, against a set of programs that were known as the War on Poverty. So a little bit of history here. In the early 1960s, there was a narrative in America that we had entered what was called the Age of Affluence. And in the Age of Affluence, everybody either was middle class or soon would be. Poverty was the sort of ugly thing of the past. It was something that had existed in the 1930s during the Great Depression. It had existed in tenement slums in the 1890s. It had existed in the slave era south and so on. But it didn't exist in the mid 20th century. It, 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 it had been sort of banished by American know-how and technology. And there was a social activist and a journalist, a man called Michael Harrington, who worked with poor people and he knew that that narrative was incomplete. He knew that there was a lot of prosperity in this country. But he also knew, because he'd seen it firsthand, that there were kids going to school in Appalachia with distended stomachs from malnutrition. And he knew that there were kids in inner cities who were going to sleep in buildings where at night they'd get bitten right by rats. And he knew that there were people who could not afford to buy shoes and were walking around rural areas in particular barefoot, not out of choice, but because they literally could not a pair, afford a pair of shoes. Harrington had worked with these men and these women and these children, and he knew that their stories were being invisibilized, that because of this idea of universal affluence, America was unwilling to recognize their existence. And so he set out to remedy it, and he set out to embarrass the um, chattering classes, the political classes, into action. And he writes this book, comes out, I think, in 62, and it's called The Other America. And he tells the stories of these millions of people who are living in poverty, surrounded by affluence. And he essentially says to Washington and to the state governments, he essentially says to them, look, you have all of these ideals, all of these great foundational ideals that we like to think define who and what America is. Ideals about equality and fairness and liberty and happiness. Now let's live up to those ideals. 
and it creates a tremendous political momentum. And Harrington essentially embarrasses Lyndon Johnson's administration into announcing a war on poverty and announcing this hugely ambitious set of programs to massively reduce the prevalence of poverty. Job training programs, drug treatment programs, affordable housing, education investments, legal system investments so poor people at trial could have legal representation. This huge transformational set of policies. And from 1964 to 1974, the poverty rate in America halves, goes down from 22% to 11%. It's a stunning success. But the thing is, Johnson had framed it wrong. He hadn't said, we're going to do a really good effort to try and reduce poverty. He'd said, almost as if he were talking about the moon landing, we're going to get to the moon, which is what Kennedy had said. He said, we're going to end poverty. Well, the thing is, if you make a claim, if you make a promise that you can't keep, no matter how far along you go toward that promise, you're going to frustrate your audience in the end. So Johnson says, we're going to eliminate poverty in America. And 10 years on, after billions or tens of billions of dollars have been spent, ordinary Americans are looking around and they still see poverty. They see homelessness, they see drug addiction, they see people who are unemployed, they see overcrowded houses, and they think nothing's changed because ordinary people who aren't statistics experts are going to have a hard time grasping the scale of transformation that actually had occurred from 64 onwards. But they look around and they see examples of poverty and they get frustrated. They think we've been throwing good money after bad. We put all this money into ending poverty and we still have people on the streets who are poor. Well, we must have been doing something wrong. We must have been creating programs that don't work. Or we must have been trying to help people who are unredeemable, who've done something wrong and therefore sort of mired themselves in poverty. And in the mid-70s, public opinion turns starkly against all of these investments. And there's a huge backlash. People get pissed off with spending tax dollars on the poor. And instead of thinking it's a societal problem, they think, ah, these are individuals with their own problems. We don't have an obligation to help them anymore. And they start voting for politicians who roll back the war on poverty. Now, if you roll back the war on poverty, something very predictable happens. You get more poverty. You roll back investments in affordable housing, you get more homeless people. You roll back investments in education, you get more people who aren't trained and educated to participate fully in the workforce. You roll back investments in public health or in mental health. You get more epidemics and you get more people living on the streets with mental illness. All of these things started happening. Harrington knew that there was a risk that they would. And at the end of his book, he says, look, if we don't get this right, if we don't keep our eye on the ball here, if we don't really make all of the moral and intellectual and political commitment that we need to this issue, 50 years down the line, somebody else is going to have to rewrite this story. Go down 40, 50 years down that line, and me and many, many other social justice journalists and social justice activists were indeed having to rewrite that story. We were indeed having to go around the country again and tell the story of poverty and misplenty, of people like Luanne Prokop being swept backwards by these forces, of those homeless kids in Las Vegas who had nowhere they could call home, of people without running water and without electricity, or of people like Mary Vazquez, a 67-year-old I met just outside Dallas, Texas, who had diabetes and heart disease and cancer and high blood pressure and should not have been working, but was too poor to stop working. And so she had a job that paid poverty wages, not for a mom and pop store, but for the biggest corporation in America, Walmart. And she was standing eight hours a day for $9 an hour, 
and she had no money left over to buy food. And I said to her, what do you eat? You've got diabetes, all the other things. You're supposed to be careful with what you ate. She says, well, if I can afford it, I buy a TV dinner at the end of the day from Walmart. And if I can't afford it, I go hungry. I went to North Philadelphia. I went to a food line. You can find food lines, much like the Great Depression era food lines, in any city in America at this point, outside churches, outside food pantries, outside community centers. And on a Saturday morning, some of those food lines will have two, three, four hundred people waiting for food. And I got there very early, and I met an old woman called Vicente Delgada. She had a brain tumor, and it was a cold winter morning. And she was sitting there on a folding chair, and she'd been there since about six in the morning. And I said, why did you get there so early? And she said to me, well, if we don't get here at six in the morning, by the time it opens at eight or nine, there's such a long line that by the time I get to the front of the line, there's no fresh meat, and it's the only time I get meat in the week. Again, this is not in a failing economy. This is in the United States, which has an abundance of money and an abundance of food, and yet somehow we haven't worked out the mechanisms to make sure that an elderly lady with brain cancer can get meat more than once a week. Now, when I started my project, I was trying to work out how to frame it, and I went to a friend of mine, a guy called Marshall Gans, who teaches at the Kennedy School of Government in Harvard. And I said to him, look, he was a community organizer. He'd worked with Cesar Chavez and the farm workers in California for many, many years. And I said to him, Marshall, help me understand this. I'm writing a book about poverty. And he stopped me, and he said, no, you're not. And the thing was, I was. I had a contract. I was writing a book on poverty. So I said, yeah, I, I am. <laughs> he said, look, let me tell you a story about the miners' canaries. And he told me a story. People have been mining for coal, for metals, for other things for thousands of years. But until very, very recently, miners didn't have gas monitoring scientific equipment. And they knew from long and bitter experience that every so often gases would accumulate and there'd be an explosion or they'd be asphyxiated. And so they tried to work out ways to um, find out if there was gas present. And so miners, if you go back 150, 200 years, miners would take down canary birds into the mines. And they did that for two reasons. The first was canary birds always chirp. They're never silent if they're healthy. So they're always chattering away next to you. But the second thing is they're really, really sensitive to gas. So if you take a canary bird down into the mine and it's chattering away and suddenly there's silence and you look over and to paraphrase Monty Python, you've got a dead canary on your hand. If you see that dead canary, you get out of that mine as quickly as you can because what it means is even though you don't know it, your atmosphere has been compromised and you're about to be poisoned. And Gantz said to me, this is how you've got to understand poverty. It's a symptom of a much bigger malaise. It's a symptom of cascading inequality that has been created, not by accidental happenstance, not by famine, not by a plague of locusts, not by a drought, not by the collapse of a political system. But it's an inequality that has been created through a set of policy choices. That if you choose to undertax people who are very, very wealthy, well, one of the consequences is you're not going to have money in your system to provide basic services for people who are very, very poor. If you choose to penalize people for their poverty, by reducing their access to welfare payments. Well, one of the most obvious consequences of that is you're going to have a lot of poor kids whose families have been removed from state assistance. If you choose not to build public housing, we don't build public housing anymore in this country. If you choose not to build public housing, an entirely predictable consequence is either an increase in homelessness or an increase in slum housing or both. Now, Marshall Gantz's intervention is really is helpful to me because as soon as he said that, I realized that I wasn't writing about a tragedy. It's very easy to think of poverty as a tragedy in the same way as we think of an earthquake as a tragedy or a tsunami as a tragedy. And we see it and it's horrible. And we throw up our hands in horror and we sort of consider it an act of nature or an act of God. And maybe we salve our conscience by giving a few dollars to a charity that might do some good work. And then we move on and we get on with our life. That's how we respond to a tragedy. 
But a scandal is something different. A scandal is man-made. A scandal is the product of human choices made or human choices not made, of priorities we have, of who we regard as important and who we regard as expendable. And if you start thinking of modern American poverty as the consequence of a set of policy choices, not just since 2008, but going back a half century, maybe even more, about how we deal with issues of race, about how we deal with issues of class, about who we value and who we don't value, about who has access to the political system and who is systematically excluded from the political system, about who or what organizations can afford to hire lobbyists to help shape tax policy or regulatory policy, and who gets excluded by that process, and who pays the consequences of those choices. If you start thinking of it that way, it's phenomenally liberating. The reason for that is, once you realize that an awful lot of what you're seeing on the streets, an awful lot of the homelessness, an awful lot of the poverty, an awful lot of the insecurity, is the product of political choices made, and cultural choices made, and economic choices made, well, then you can start thinking about solutions. I'm not going to talk in detail about my solutions. You can ask me questions about them if you want, but I'll give you a few ideas. I can't really see too much because of the bright lights, but let me try this. How many of you guys have student debt? Awful lot of you. And when I go to some colleges, it's a far higher percentage. I go to some colleges and I ask that question, every single hand in the room goes up. How many of you think you're going to be spending more than $400 a year servicing that debt when you graduate? Any of you who has debt, you're going to be spending more than $400 a year servicing it. If you created a funding mechanism for higher education based on Social Security, every wage earner in the country pays one quarter of 1% into an education fund and every employer in the country pays one quarter of 1%. Because of the scale of the American labor market, you could create enough money to make sure that every single 18-year-old had the opportunity to go to a public four-year college without paying fees. $400 a year is what it would cost because that is the average cost of a quarter percent tax on employers and employees. The matter of political will. You could create something called a financial transaction tax. Every single bank, every single hedge fund, every single insurer has algorithms going these days that do an enormous level of market trades, not because they need to, not because they're socially useful, but because they're trading on tiny, tiny, tiny computer-identified profit margins. Margins that are invisible to an individual investor, but that computers can work out. Every day, billions of these trades go on, which is why progressive economists around the world, people like Jamie Galbraith, very senior economist, Dean Baker, have said, look, you can tax that market tax. If you're trading billions of these little trades every single day, put a quarter percent, a one percent, or a two percent tax on. Because what it does is it generates not just five, 10, 20, it generates hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue. And you could earmark that for whatever you want. You could say, look, we're going to earmark 50 billion for investing in schools because schools are crumbling. We can invest 10 or 20 billion in affordable housing. You could pick and choose how you invested it. But the financial transaction tax would generate a tremendous amount of money for a modern day war on poverty. We could reestablish a fair, progressive estate tax. Conservatives call the estate tax a death tax, and they say, well, it's completely unfair because if you die, your kids should not have to pay tax on the inheritance. Well, for most of the 20th century, we did pay tax on it, and it, was a double, it had two purposes. Number one, it gave money for these vital public investments, and number two, it prevented the institutionalization of an aristocracy. Because if you don't tax inheritance, 
There's nothing stopping Donald Trump passing his two or ten or however many billion dollars he has down to his kids tax-free. They haven't worked for it, but suddenly they have ten billion dollars, which is not socially healthy. You want that money to flow, and you want social mobility to be an opportunity for all, not just for an elite. Each year in America, only 6,000 families a year are taxed when someone dies because we now do not tax estates that are worth less than several million dollars. Most other countries, most other wealthy first world countries, tax estates. That's not a technical question. It might sound sort of policy wonkish. But it's about ways to raise money to fight poverty and to fight inequality. And there are many other ways, some involving taxes, some involving private-public partnerships, some involving community effort, some involving volunteerism. And none of these policies are easy, and none of these changes will happen overnight. And anyone who tells you that you can wave a magic wand and make America great again in the space of one election cycle, or one debate, or one tweet, is spinning a tail because you can't. Because these things took decades to generate and messes like this can never ever be sorted out instantaneously. But here's where I'm going to end it. It's always been a moral and an ethical imperative to speak up for the vulnerable and to give the vulnerable a platform so they can express themselves in the political process and in the economy. It's always been a moral and an ethical imperative to hear the stories of those kids in Las Vegas or the unemployed woman in Pennsylvania or the family without running water in New Mexico. But now it's not just a moral imperative and now it's not just an ethical imperative. Now it's a political imperative. Because Marshall Gantz was right. The poverty and the inequality and the pain and the rage and the fear and the frustration that accompanies that poverty and that inequality now is at such a critical mass that it risks destroying our political system. And Gantz said to me three, four, five years ago when I interviewed him, Democracies throughout history have not survived the levels of inequality we are now witnessing. And he quoted Pericles, the ancient Athenian statesman Pericles, about the dangers that are unleashed by inequality. They corrode a sense of common community and they pave the way to tyranny and they pave the way to demagoguery. Demagoguery is an ancient Greek word. So I'll end where I started. We do not make poverty better by saying to one group, your ills will be healed if only you blame another group. We do not make society fairer by saying to one group, I will solve your problems at the expense of another group. If we do not tackle poverty and tackle inequality, if we do not provide a space for these issues to be intelligently and carefully thought about and discussed and debated, we will cede the ground to demagogues. And if we cede the ground to demagogues, a democracy that has taken hundreds of years to develop will be under siege by tribalism and by nationalism. And I do not believe that can stand. So that's where I'm going to end it. We need to care about poverty because it is the single biggest crisis facing our economy and now the single biggest crisis facing our body politic. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much. And I just uh, said to uh, Mr. Abramsky, this doesn't happen very often, standing ovations. So that's, that's quite impressive. Congratulations. Uh, I'm only up here to, re to remind you all that we're now in the Q&A portion of our program, question and answers. Please, uh, if you have questions, we'll do this for a short time. Uh, please come to these microphones. Mr. Abramsky will recognize you in turn. Keep your questions brief, to the point. Oh yes, one other thing. Please let the students come first. Let the students ask the questions first and then we'll have time for community people if, if we run out of student questions. So students, you come forward first, please. My name is Sofia. Um, I was wondering, what role do you think gentri gentrification and urban planning plays in perpetuating poverty? Okay. Uh, Sofia, that's a great question. And I was, I was actually down in Los Angeles two weeks ago doing a story on this. And you had this absurd situation going on that Los Angeles, for years and years, didn't really have a functioning metro system, and so people were driving everywhere. And over the last few years, they've made a really huge investment in their public transport, and they now have a really good metro system that's beginning to expand to all corners of the city, and that's great. But one of the things that's accompanied it is along these transit corridors, which are in working class, mainly Latino and Asian communities, in these transit corridors, suddenly you've got these real estate booms because everybody wants to develop these upscale properties in neighborhoods where there's now a really good functioning 20 out of 24 hour a day metro. And so one of the unintended side effects is you've now got these working class communities with public transit running through them and it's undermining the viability of the working class community because it's bringing in people who can pay two or three times as much in rent as the existing tenants. And so I think you, it's a huge problem that you see it in San Francisco, you see it in Los Angeles, you see it in New York, you see it in city after city that these areas that historically were working class communities are suddenly being gentrified and they're pricing people out of the region. And so you have people who used to live in one area who are now sort of priced 30 or 40 miles out and they have to now commute 30 or 40 miles into work and they sort of become service workers for a new professional class. And it doesn't work. It works in the short term. It generates a lot of money for landlords in the short term. It generates a lot of money for new restaurants and all of the sort of things that accompany gentrification. But it doesn't work in terms of keeping communities viable. So I, I would say you're absolutely right. If you're going to talk about poverty in this country, there has to be a coherent plan around gentrification. You can never stop it entirely. Neighborhoods come, they go, re neighborhoods rise and fall. I mean, that's how cities have always functioned. But you can mitigate it. You can invest properly in affordable housing. You can invest properly in public housing. You can support policies like rent control, which used to be the sort of law of the land in most cities in America, and increasingly are the exceptions rather than the norm. And that's because real estate has been very good at lobbying for repeal of rent control laws. And that's about political power. Who has power? Who has influence in city councils and state houses and even up at the federal level? Um, so you're completely right on this, that any conversation about poverty has to have a conversation about how we arrange our urban living and how we keep them multi-income so that they don't just become sort of playthings of the young and of the rich. I hope that answers the question. I have a follow-up. Go for it. Um, about Detroit, do you think this um, system would help them just because of the situation they're in? Or do you think it'll just be a short-term solution to the bigger issue? You know, I think Detroit's a city with so many unique problems of its own that the conversation is partly about gentrification, but a bigger conversation at the moment is that there are entire neighborhoods which are vacant, that you have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of boarded up houses, and you have entire regions of that city now where the residents who remain have been disconnected from the water supply because they can't pay bills and the electricity supply because they can't pay bills. So you see this sort of rather apocalyptic environment, not in all of Detroit, but in parts of Detroit, 
where you have people essentially squatting in houses that they used to own or rent without basic amenities like running water and electricity. Um, and it's actually, I don't know how many of you have spent time in Detroit, but some of it's very surreal. There are these urban gardens that have grown up in the shadows of the skyscrapers of downtown, just a few hundred meters from downtown, where abandoned communities are now sort of re-coalescing around urban agriculture. And, you know, I was there a couple of years ago doing reporting, and you literally see cows in some of these. You see cows and horses and donkeys in some of these bigger farms. And I don't know if this is a sort of vision of what the future will look like. Some people say it is. Some people say Detroit is sort of became so dysfunctional that it's now becoming almost utopian in its responses and that it's giving us a glimpse of what urban life will look like 20, 30, 40 years from now. And that's possible. And some of it's good. I mean, the, some of the urban agriculture is really interesting. But the idea of thousands upon thousands of abandoned or semi-abandoned homes, that to me seems to be catastrophic. And the city's attempts to shrink the size of the city by sort of denying basic services to the outer, outer reaches of the city, again, it might be necessary, but I think that you know, those are the problems in Detroit rather than gentrification at the moment, I think. All right, you're welcome. Anyone else? Otherwise, you get another question. Hi, thanks for this opportunity to talk about this topic. I've, I've already voted uh, for Donald Trump for uh, absentee. Okay. So we can disagree politically about Absolutely. a structure. Um, but I also voted for Obama twice. And when I met him in 2005, we had a 15 minute conversation about poverty in our country. And I encouraged him that if he became president, we were talking in Chicago, uh, that he not forget the poor and he do what he can with his power to help the poor, but poverty has increased in his eight years as president. So what I want to ask you is, aside from political structures, which may help people who are suffering, and I think people in both parties would agree there is suffering in our country, can we take it to another level and talk about divine mercy, where salvation is found in our faith, and in the context of the Jesuits being the wealthiest Catholic order, in the history of the Catholic Church. How would you take wealth and approach social justice from a point of view of what is best for the greatest number of people? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll answer that in, in the best way I can. I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not religious, so I'm not exactly the right person to talk about divine mercy. But I will say this. Over the summer, I read the Pope's book, The Name of God is Mercy. And he talks, very, writes very, very eloquently about the role of mercy in society and in culture and as a healing mechanism. And religious or not, I do agree very much with that philosophy that we are very quick to judge people. Especially in this country, we're very quick to judge poor people. And we're very quick to assign blame to poor people for their circumstances. Now whether or not what we need is mercy or whether or not what we need is a more nuanced understanding of the politics around poverty, I'm not sure if I would use the word mercy in that context, but what I would say is we need a more sensitive understanding of poverty. Case in point might be the war on drugs. We've spent 40 years locking up young, poor, disproportionately black and brown people for drugs. And in that 40 years, we have underinvested in drug treatment. In that 40 years, we've underinvested in all of the things that might give people an alternative to drugs and an alternative to addiction, whether it's job training or whether it's counseling or whether it's mental health infrastructure. And instead, we've put our resources, and however wealthy we are as a society, we still have finite resources. We've put our resources to the tune of tens of billions of dollars into an incarceration system that is anything but merciful. You know, I, I spent a lot of time going around prisons in the 1990s and early 2000s and talking to people, many of them who had spent years and years in solitary confinement in cells six by eight feet and they were alone 23 hours a day. And I can't for the life of me imagine living 
in one of those cells for a week, let alone a month, let alone a year, let alone a decade. But we put thousands and thousands and thousands of people into solitary confinement. And we put millions and millions of people into prison. And we don't just put them in for a month or two or three. We hand out 10 and 20 in life sentences as if they were candy. And it was brought home to me how absurd this was when I started comparing the sentences that we give to drug dealers, not to drug kingpins, but to very low-end, oftentimes non-violent drug offenders, comparing them to the sentences that were handed down at Nuremberg to Nazi war criminals. And apart from the handful of Nazi war criminals who got the death penalty, most of the top Nazis were sentenced to finite terms that tapped out at about 20 years, including Hitler's confidant, Albert Speer. And the reason that the judges at Nuremberg tapped out their sentences at 10 or 20 years was they thought that was about as horrendous a punishment as they could inflict on a person. We give out 10 and 20 year sentences to people for a few grams of cocaine. We give out tougher sentences to a young kid who's in the wrong place at the wrong time than our grandparents' generation did to top Nazi war criminals. And that to me is just morally a stench. And whether one is a supporter of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, I think this is one of the great issues, and it's tied in with poverty, but this is one of the great issues of the next few years, is how do we unravel the mass incarceration state that we created from the 1990s into the, from 1970s into the 2000s? Um, so I hope that partly answers your question. In terms of your other question, the only thing I'll say about Obama and poverty Poverty numbers haven't gone up under Obama. The poverty numbers have actually gone down. They're still stunningly high, as I've been talking about for the last hour. But if you actually look at the poverty numbers, they went down under Obama. They peaked, and they peaked dramatically under George Bush. And they went up and up and up under George Bush as one social program after another after another was cut. And they also go back before George Bush. If you want to look at real sort of ingrained deep poverty, one of the things that happened under Bill Clinton was welfare reform. And welfare reform slashed welfare benefits for millions of low-income families. And whatever the motives, whether they were good or bad, of that policy, the impact was an awful lot of people, including millions and millions of children, now have less access to cash assistance than they did 30 or 40 years ago. So I, I, don't, I by no means think this is only a Republican versus Democratic issue. I think both parties have a heap of blame on this one. But I would challenge the idea that poverty sort of skyrocketed under Obama because I don't think the data bears that out. Anybody else? I just had a quick question. I so appreciate you talking about taxes and how it could be a, um, a resource. But I think one of the problems that we have, not only in Minnesota and especially in Duluth recently, is that how, um, how would you suggest if you are a part of a government um, and are needing to increase your taxes, it's not always a popular um, stance to have. And so the marketing um, perspective around that, how do you educate yeah. um, your public to let them know about increasing taxes and the benefits that it could have for the community? Yeah. No, I think that's a very good question, and here's my answer. If a person is consistently sold lemons, they get suspicious of the dealer. And we live in a country which for years and years and years has underfinanced government services, and therefore government services are shoddy. So we pay taxes, and yet our kids go to overcrowded schools. We pay taxes, but we damage our car when we drive over an unrepaired pothole. We pay taxes and then we get sick and we need to go on workers' comp and we have to file a mountain of paperwork and we deal with a bureaucracy that views us as the enemy. And so, of course, over time, if we're consistently sold lemons, we get suspicious of government. And that's been a very deliberate strategy of conservatives um, for a generation now, since Reagan and the, the anti-tax revolts of the late 70s and the 80s under Reagan. It's been a policy of conservatives to do what the conservative philosopher Grover Norquist, who's one of the more influential figures in modern conservatism, has termed starve the beast. And Norquist's infamous claim was that you could starve government, starve the beast, until it was of a size that you could strangle it in the bathtub. 
That was his ambition. Now, what that means is two generations of Americans have grown up thinking that taxes are equatable to highway robbery, that there's no payback. If you give taxes, it goes into a black hole. And therefore, the response is shrink government, government is bad, vote for anti-tax candidates. Well, the problem with that is we need social services. Nobody's worked out a better way to provide schooling to millions and millions of people, for example, than through taxes. Nobody's worked out a better way to keep roads going or do basic environmental safety work or whatever it might be or provide public safety than through taxes. So somehow we're going to have to pay taxes. But we're going to be more willing to pay more taxes. And I'm not, believe me, I'm not saying we should pay as much taxes as possible for as many programs as possible, but I am saying there has to be room for some tax increases for smart programs that benefit a lot of people. And how do you get people to be willing to go along with that? I would say you quote Social Security. Nobody opposes Social Security apart from a few libertarians. But it's got overwhelming political support. And the reason it has overwhelming political support is it's kept four generations of elderly Americans out of poverty. And people know that. They can see the personal benefit. So nobody objects to paying into Social Security because they know it's going to be a hedge against poverty in old age. Same thing with Medicare. Very, very few people actively oppose Medicare. They might oppose Medicaid for able-bodied younger people, but Medicare for the elderly has overwhelming bipartisan support. And again, the reason for that is people see the payoff. They pay taxes into a program where they get guaranteed health care at the end of the day. So how do you do that? I'll come back to my education opportunity fund. And I write about this in my book. If you could create a program that connects with millions of Americans in the same way as Social Security connected with the generation of Americans that was coming of age in the 1930s, if you could connect with millions of Americans through a modern day social security initiative around education, I believe you could reestablish some confidence in the government's ability to sell things that are better than lemons. It doesn't just have to be education, but that's a particularly good example because everybody can see the benefit of access to education. Um, you could also do it around environmental initiatives. Even though you know, frightening numbers of people might deny climate change, when push comes to shove, I don't think too many people want to live in a wrecked climate where their coastal homes are regularly flooded, where hurricanes intensify, where freak droughts and freak storms cease to become freak and become the norm. If you could create viable environmental interventions through public investments, again, you'd be selling the public something a whole bunch better than lemons. So that would be my answer, that you can't do it if you're only going to offer mediocre programs, but you can do it if you think big and offer programs that actually impact a lot of people's lives for the better. Any other questions? One more question, all right? Go for it. One more. With the increase in media and the decrease in millennials' involvement in politics, how can millennials like me change the direction our economy is going when there's so little people that are interested about this topic? You know, that's a horrifyingly pessimistic question. <laughs> you know, I'm going to give you two answers. The first is the pessimistic answer, which is that I teach a lot of classes at UC Davis, and I don't disagree with you that a lot of young people are very disconnected for many reasons from politics and very cynical about it, don't think it impacts their lives, they don't necessarily read newspapers or any other form of systemic news anymore. Um, and that's a real problem. And so the pessimistic answer is, unless you find some way to re-engage a generation of people in the big issues of the day, whether it's poverty or whether it's climate change or whether it's terrorism or whatever you define as the big issues, but unless you cultivate a sense that there are bigger, more important issues out there than oneself. It's going to be very hard to create movements for change. That's the pessimistic answer. The optimistic answer is, I'm not sure I buy your premise. And the reason for that is, if you look around the country, there are young people all over the country finding ways to intervene, whether it's through new thinking around the environment or new ways of using technology and the creation of new markets that are based around exchanges of goods or exchanges of services and that are less profit-based. 
There are young people thinking creatively about big picture issues all the time. The challenge is, how do you marshal that into something that looks more like a movement? So you've got all these atomized groups all over the country using social media, using other computer technology to create buzz around a particular issue. And you can create a charity and instantaneously, if it's a good thing, you might get a million dollars in people you know, giving donations in a way you could never do in the past. But these are all sort of atomized things. So the challenge is, how do you get a young generation to think about big picture change where all these different issues are linked together, where people see the connections between the environment and social justice, or between labor conditions and healthcare access, all these things which in reality are deeply, deeply interconnected and play out in the political realm. How do you get young people reconnected with the political process as well as just re-engaged with these individual ideas? I'm not sure there's an easy answer to that. But I do know that every few decades, for whatever mystical reason, young people pour out creative political energy. We saw it in the 1960s, we saw it in the 1930s. You go back to the World War I period, you see it. You saw it in the 1840s in Europe. Every so often, there's a generation that looks around and says, we don't like what we see, and we're going to try and change things. And sometimes they get it right, and sometimes they get it wrong. But I suspect we're coming to one of those moments where young people start standing up and really making their voices heard. And not just because of this election, but because there's an awful lot of issues for you to care about, because you're inheriting a world with a lot of problems, whether it's international conflict, or whether it's climate change, or whether it's population pressures. There are a lot of issues that are impacting your generation and will impact your generation for many, many years to come. So my, my suspicion is that the zeitgeist, that mystical spirit of the times, will make itself felt fairly soon and that you're going to start seeing a lot of you know, really interesting activism going on. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. Thank you.